from there to here, from here to there, funny things are everywhere. All this does is make more spots, we yelled at the cat. Your cats are no good. Put them back in your hat. When at last we are sure you've been properly pilled, then a few paper forms must be properly filled so that you and your heirs may be properly built. Waved me a wave that was friendly and kind. Welcome, he said as he gave me his hand. Welcome, my son, to this beautiful land. Welcome to sweet, sunny Salisalu, where we never have troubles, at least very few. And suppose that you lived in that forest in France, where the average young person just hasn't a chance to escape from the perilous pants-eating plants. But your pants are safe. You're a fortunate guy, and you ought to be shouting, How lucky am I? We are lucky. Man, Dr. Seuss knew what he was talking about, didn't he? And you're here because you know that. I'm here because I know that, too. You're a fan of it, and so am I. Dr. Seuss got it. He, Dr. Seuss only has one book that I'm aware of that really looks at a plant, focuses on nature in a very specific way, and that would be, of course, <laughs> the Lorax, uh, which focuses on the Truffula tree, which we'll look at that. And so from this, we know that Dr. Seuss holds plants, the environment, the interactions between plants and animals in high regard, right? I mean, the Lorax does a pretty decent job of connecting those trees to the different animals, the swami swans and the brown barbaloots in their barbaloot suits <laughs> and the hummingfish, right? Ecosystems, organisms, plants, animals, all connected. And we, humans, have a really big responsibility for letting those things thrive and stay connected, right? We can destroy or we can create and support. I'm also thinking a little bit here about the Butter Battle Book. Butter Battle Book. Butter Battle Book. <laughs> Where, again, Dr. Seuss really points at us, right? At humans, us, and our ability to destroy or to not just create, but create like a thriving home, a thriving community, like a thriving town, right? And plants, native plants, that's thriving. That's supporting. That's encouraging. That's, that's celebrating, right? Beyond the Lorax, um, Dr. Seuss does have a couple mentions in a couple books of flowers. So Daisy had Maisie, of course, but also in the book Happy Birthday to You. And more to the point, he's got lots, loads, like oodles of illustrations of different flowers in a lot of his books. Um, and that's really where I'm going to tunnel in today. So first, before we can make a native flower garden plan uh, for fans of Dr. Seuss, with Dr. Seuss in mind, we have to understand the flower types that Dr. Seuss really went for, right? Like the flower types he really liked to draw. And so what I did was get all the Dr. Seuss books that I could get my hands on. So you've been looking at a bunch of them here for a bit uh, to see what flower types he really drew a lot of. And so the books that I ignored here are books that Dr. Seuss wrote but did not illustrate. So for those books, he went by the name Theo Le Sieg, and I completely ignored those because those aren't his drawings. Um, I mostly ignored his works that were movies before they were books because they're, I don't know, sometimes not enough Dr. Seuss. There's other people's hands there, you know, uh, except Daisy Had Maisie. And so I just focus on books that Dr. Seuss wrote and drew. Okay, another side note. I know in 2021, a few Dr. Seuss books were or are no longer going to be printed anymore because of racial stereotypes in them. And I kind of hemmed and hawed a little bit on how to handle that. But I decided that I'm going to neither intentionally exclude or intentionally include those books I'm just going to go through all of his books that I can get my hands on looking for flowers and plants. So some of those books are in, some aren't, you know, whatever. And so I went through all of these books and I drew, um, 
<clears throat> you can see my sad drawings here. <laughs> I'm no Dr. Seuss with my illustrations. Um, the different flowers that I saw in all of these books. And then in not too long, it became really clear that there was like a, a handful of flower types and plant types and shapes that Dr. Seuss really, really honed in on and repeated a lot. And so what are those, you're wondering? That's such a good question. Thank you for asking. <laughs> So up on the screen right now, I have the different flower types uh, that seem to be repeated a lot. And so the first flower type up there um, is odd looking flowers. And I feel like pretty much everybody agrees with that, right? If you think of Dr. Seuss flowers, something that's going to cross your mind is like, oh yeah, weird looking flowers. Yes, check. Okay. Uh, type two are tubular flowers. So for all these flower types, I'm going to point out a few examples in his books and his illustrations. And so this is from the book Happy Birthday to You, and I'm showing you some tubular flowers. So these are flowers that make like little tubes. And he seemed to dig that a bit. This poor guy is the bee watcher, but because he falls asleep or sometimes he needs a bee watcher watcher who watches the watcher who watches the bee. <laughs> oh, it's also good. Um, okay, third flower type, puffy flowers. Oh, here I'm showing you. I did my fingernail to look like a truffula tree. Lovely. Um, so the truffula trees have this puffy top from the Lorax, and um, I'll show you a couple other examples here of puffy type tops on flowers and plants. So on Beyond Zebra, we've got sort of a fluffy puffy top. Happy birthday to you again. There's so many flowers in this book. These sort of trees at the beginning are little puff balls, right? <clears throat> and so when we get to this native flower garden, I just want to say in case I forget, a lot of the flowers, um, when they go to seed, when they're done flowering, um, their seed heads are fluffy or like puffy looking. And so even if some of the flowers I choose are not all fluffy or puffy, of course, um, nearly all of them have puffy looking seed heads. So that's in keeping. Okay, so I got a lot of examples of puffy flowers here. Oh, I love this one. In Horton Hears a Who, and you finally get to the page where that dumb bird dropped his flower and, and you go to this page and it's so beautiful all the pink puffy flowers but you go oh Horton I'm so sorry you have to look through all these oh okay so the fourth type I saw a lot of is tiered flowers so multiple tiers on the flowers oh I'm showing you my other nail <laughs> I tried to make it look like these flowers from I had trouble in getting to Sala Salu again the best Dr. Seuss book there is right Okay, and more flowers from Happy Birthday to You. So again, these tiered flowers, multiple flowers coming in. And here, this is my favorite tiered flower of his. How cool is that? Very cool, native flower part. I know. Thank you for saying so. Um, <clears throat> I remember as a kid going on a road trip once and in the back seat, and I had some paper and crayons, and I remember just trying to, my objective was I was going to invent all these different flowers, and so I drew all these different types of flowers, and I ended up with a lot of tiered flowers as well, so I can't really blame Dr. Seuss for his interest in tiered flowers, because yeah, man, they look cool. <laughs> they look freaking cool, and if you're going to invent flowers, tiers are pretty sweet. Okay. Now, I think sometimes overlooked is the simple flowers. He has a lot of flowers in his books that are sort of like a, a typical flower shape, simple, basic flower shape. Like if you told a kid, draw a flower, they'd probably draw something for you that looked a little bit like a daisy or something, right? Like a some color in the middle and then, I don't know, five or six or seven petals on the outside, right? I don't know what to call that flower shape, like your stereotypical flower, simple, basic flower shape. Again, another Sala Salu example. I just can't help myself. Um, and so you can see in all these books, you've got these simple flower shapes. He really liked those um, a lot too, as far as I can tell. 
And of course, Daisy had Maisie, the one flower in this story, a daisy. <clears throat> okay. And then the last flower type that he uh, used a lot is the multi multicolored flower type. And that, I mean, that makes sense. <laughs> Again, odd looking flowers and multicolored. That's what you would expect from Dr. Seuss. So here with Horton and the Quagga Bug, we've got a very interesting looking plant, <laughs> multi multicolored. And here's that bee watcher again, who behind him has a bee watcher watcher, but that's a multicolored flower, multicolored and tubular. <laughs> Okay, again from Sala Salu, uh, the tiered flowers are also multicolored, like super multicolored, right? It'd be super cool if we had flowers like that for real. And then here at the beginning of Sala Salu, we've got a multicolored, but also that simple basic flower shape type too, right? You should read that book. It's really good. And then obviously, Happy Birthday to You has, I mean, Pretty much every flower in here is multicolored, right? How many colors can we cram in here? <laughs> that almost sounded like I was mocking him. I'm not. Not at all. Good golly. Who could mock Dr. Seuss? Nobody. It'd be crazy. Okay. So very cool multicolored flowers. So that is my list of flower types that I noticed uh, were repeated a lot by Dr. Seuss. Of note, he does have a lot of cacti, spindly looking evergreens, and trees that are sort of flat looking on top. And I didn't, I did not include any of those in this garden because I'm not doing trees. Um, so that knocks those out. And I don't live in a desert. Uh, so cacti are sort of out too. Um, there is the eastern prickly pear cactus. Wait, did I say that right? Uh, yeah, I think so. And anyways, um, that wasn't going to work for uh, the soil uh, of my of the garden I've planned. So I didn't include it. So here uh, for our Dr. Seuss native flower garden, I've got the specs up there for you to see. Um, so full sun, loamy soil, medium wet to medium dry soil. Uh, the sun, some partial sun is acceptable and will work. And if your soil is loamy, leaning a little bit towards sand or leaning a little bit towards clay, that will be acceptable and work. But if you are sitting on a sand dune or you are sitting on a giant chunk of clay, uh, this garden probably won't do so well. Overall, there are a couple plants will do okay, but overall it won't do well. Okay, so... Um, in this garden, I have 10 different native plants and flowers. Well, kind of 11. And if that is too much for you, that's no problem. You can absolutely cut some of those out, and you will still be looking at something beautiful and Seussian. Um, okay, and so you can see I'm drawing here the garden shape, and I've got the street uh, up at the top of the screen, and closest to you would be like your home. And here are the, the, the following features for this garden shape. Uh, number one, you're going to plop it right in the middle of your front lawn. That's right. I've made the shape so you can get a lawnmower around it easily. Um, and there are lots of YouTube videos on how to kill your lawn to put in a native flower garden. Instead, I'll give you some links. Um, I'm probably going to do a video of that on my own in the future, not too long, because um, I have done a little bit of that myself. <laughs> okay. Um, two, in the side of the garden that is facing your, your home, I have a little strip of grass lawn that goes into the center of the garden. And hidden uh, from the road in the spring and the summer, the width of that little path will be the width of your lawnmower. So you can just mow in there and then pull the lawnmower right back out. And at the end of that little path, I've got like a little bench or a stump or something if you have one. And this is your lurkum. That's from the Lorax. Um, where you can sit and enjoy your flowers around you. And on that lurkum bench, if you're crafty and savvy, you can even carve into that bench the one word, unless. Another Lorax reference. Okay, another, like, number three feature here of this um, garden is that instead of big bunches of native plants in a singular place, which is, sorry for the noise in the background right now, if you can hear that, um, often a lot of non-native garden designers do bunches of plants in very singular places. Um, 
I've done a different method here that is a little bit more natural and pretty to our eyes. And it comes more from the environment um, and is more supportive of native pollinators and plants. Um, and that is to create bunches and drifts drifts is the word, bunches and sort of lines of plants of one kind where your eyes can sort of see them and then follow through the garden. Your eyes get sort of led through the garden, right? And so your eyes naturally flow over the area. Bonus, over time, uh, the plants, uh, so if you let them go to seed, which you will, um, and the seeds drop, uh, new plants of these types will come up, which is great. Um, and they will probably shift where they are precisely located. And that's good. The plants will sort of let you know where they best grow. And so each year you're going to get like a little shift in where things are growing. So if this one spot isn't the best for that plant, it will sort of drift over to where it grows better and things will move around a little. And, and you'll let that happen. Because this quote I have on the screen is from Charles Dudley Warner, and at the end of it there you can see, um, let's see, uh, he sort of wishes he had let nature make the garden according to her own notion. So sometimes he's sort of fighting nature to try to have plants where he wants them and not where he doesn't want them, and he's saying, if I had just let her make the choices a little bit, it might have gone a little easier. And so that is part of the idea of this garden too, is it'll shift a little where these plants are and you can let them shift. That's okay. Nature will let you know where some of these plants grow best in this sort of micro nuanced way. And if you're cranky right now that I've included Charles Dudley Warner and a quote of him and not a Dr. Seuss quote, I've got a Dr. Seuss quote now <laughs> that gets at the same idea. I mean, sort of a Dr. Seuss quote. It's from the Lorax movie from 2012. And it says, um, I know it may seem small and insignificant, but it's not about what it is. It's about what it can become. And so that's kind of the idea is it's not just about what the garden is at the beginning when you're just getting it started. It's about what it can become, what it will grow into and shift it into over time, right? Okay, so with all of that in mind now, let's parade out these native plants like a parade you thought you saw going down Mulberry Street. Alrighty, tidy, for our very first plant, plant number one, uh, we have Menarda didyma. So uh, you're going to see here where I'm drawing this in on our garden. Now, I would put it all over the place because I love this plant. <laughs> but Monarda didyma can spread. Uh, so you don't need to put her in all that many places and she'll move a little bit on her own. And here she is. So it's also called red bee balm. Uh, the red, you can see why. Uh, bee balm, all these Monardas, um, if you uh, take their leaves and crush them up, They've been used historically as a balm on bee stings to feel better, or to help bee stings feel better. So that's cool. But I chose this one for our Dr. Seuss garden because it is odd looking. <laughs> uh, the little flowers uh, in the individual flowers on there are actually tubular. The seed head is puffy. Um, and Monarda didyma um, can be a tiered flower sometimes. So one of these, in one of these videos, um, I don't see it on screen at this exact moment, but one of them does get tiered. So this can occur um, sometimes. But overall, when I was making a Dr. Seuss garden, the very first thought that crossed my mind was, oh, the Monardas <laughs> and the Liatris species. <laughs> so there's going to be a couple Monardas because what a funny, cool, odd looking flower. <laughs> Dr. Seussian indeed. And so now here on my little drawing of our garden plan, I'm going to color in that number one Minerta didyma in red because it's red. Uh, sometimes they can lean a little bit dark pink instead of red. Um, I like them best when they're red. <laughs> okay, now for plant number two in our Dr. Seuss uh, garden, Another Minarda, this would be Minarda fistulosa, commonly called wild bergamot. Um, wild bergamot also can spread a little bit on its own. Um, but as you can see, I've got these two Minardas uh, sort of next to each other. And here she is. So a similar looking flower, and you can see, um, if you can look closely, each of the individual little flowers um, 
are actually tubular, which Dr. Seuss likes. Of course, it's an odd-looking flower, just like the Monarda didyma. Um, it's just, <laughs> I could imagine this flower in a Dr. Seuss drawing, right? Um, the seed head, when they go to seed, is puffy-looking. And Monarda didymas uh, can be tiered as well, although just like with Monarda didyma, it's not the most common, but it, it can happen now and then. So I have written for these different plants um, whether they're a host plant. And so this is a host plant for the hermit sphinx moth. And what that means is uh, the caterpillars of a moth or a butterfly species, the adult will lay eggs here on this plant, and then the little baby caterpillars uh, will come out of those eggs and they'll eat the leaves on the plant. That's what a host plant is. And so they'll eat the leaves and then they can make their little cocoon to become a butterfly or a moth. And so <clears throat> being a host plant, most native plants are a host plant to something. Um, it's very important to the pollinator life cycle, to the butterfly and moth life cycle. Uh, you need to have uh, leaves on some plants get chomped on. <laughs> Those caterpillars have to eat. Uh, so Monarda fistulosa is the host plant uh, for a sphinx moth. And now here we are. Or here we here I am <laughs> coloring in the number two plant Monarda fistulosa on this garden design drawing here and so as you saw it's sort of a purplish color maybe it leans a little bit light pink here and there so you can see where those are and you can see a little bit a little bit now the idea of the clumps and the drifts that I had mentioned where I'm clumping up these Monardas together but you can also see them in a few spots drifting across that garden. All right, moving on again. Plant number three is Eryngium eucophilium. You've also heard it Eryngium eucophilium. Uh, so Rattlesnake Master is what this is commonly called. And I don't have it in all that many places. Um, just in a couple spots popping up. I think it's a neat one to have... Uh, not a lot of in a garden, but just a little bit. It's one of this interesting looking odd little plants, right? Look at this thing. <laughs> so um, the doctor, the Seussian qualities of this one to me um, is that the flowers look, they have that puffy flower look and they are odd looking. They're, they're a little odd looking, right? <laughs> they look like little golf balls on top of a stem. Um, and little pokey leaves that are cactus-like. Uh, I didn't put any cacti in this garden, but cactuses or cacti are another type of plant that Dr. Seuss uses a lot in his books. Um, so this rattlesnake master will also speak to that a little bit. Um, rattlesnake master is also the host plant for a couple different butterflies and moths. Which is always good. So again, you know, when you plant these plants, if, if the leaves get holes in them, um, we are taught that this is bad and like, oh, I got to spray because the leaves must be perfectly whole at all times. You don't want them to be perfectly whole <laughs> at all times. You want them to be food for butterfly and moth caterpillars and you want to create a little mini ecosystem in your yard. Um, and the plants and the insects, they all have their roles in those little ecosystems. So you'll want to see a couple little holes and know that caterpillars are getting meals because if you want to see butterflies, you got to feed those caterpillars. <laughs> and so I wasn't entirely sure how to color this one in. <laughs> so I went with sort of a greenish. Anyways, uh, so I only have two of those here. But if you really like it, of course, with any of these flowers, you can add more or less into your own garden, right? You're smart, you're clever, you know what you can do. Moving on now to plant number four. Uh, here I am drawing it in. Now, I say this about a lot of plants, but this is one of my favorites. Um, so this is Liatris ligulostylus, or the meadow blazing star. So the blazing stars, the Liatris species, are another one I immediately thought of when I thought of Dr. Seuss, because they're they're odd looking, they're funny looking little flowers. <laughs> um, so I've got a number of the Meadow Blazing Star, and you can really get a better sense of the clumps and drifts when you see all those number fours on there. They sort of clump together, but also drift across, right? 
And so here is the Meadow Blazing Star. And so you can see the flowers are sort of, um, just the way the whole plant looks is a little odd. And then um, those puffy flowers, right? Those puffy flowers uh, are very Seussian, especially when we get a little closer. You, you'll see like, oh yeah, that looks like something Dr. Seuss might draw. Um, and you just saw that monarch butterfly there. So Liatris ligulostylus uh, is one plant that really, really draws in monarch butterflies. It actually um, has, uh, I, if I understand properly, it makes the sex pheromones of monarchs specifically to draw monarch butterflies in, right? So they're kind of tricking those monarch butterflies into coming on in. Uh, so that's pretty sweet. Now, the monarch butterflies will not lay eggs on Liatris ligulostylus. It just is a plant they'll come to for nectar. Um, the milkweeds are the only thing that the monarch butterflies will lay eggs on and the caterpillars will eat. Uh, but this is a favored plant for the adult monarchs to get nectar from. So Liatris ligulostylus is critically imperiled, imperiled, uh, or vulnerable in some states in our country. Uh, overall, it is considered secure, though. People who have this plant in their yard will often say it is not unusual at all to go and look at this plant in your yard and see nine or ten monarch butterflies on it at the same time. So this particular video, you're only seeing one. On this day, I had two that kept flying around this particular plant, but it's not unusual to see a lot actually, which is pretty sweet. But anyways, for Dr. Seuss, um, this is a very Seussian looking flower. And those leaves, even the way those leaves can be sort of wavy like that. You see how they look kind of wavy? Um, that's a Dr. Seuss-like way to draw things. And then here's a close-up of those flowers, right? And my dirty, dirty hands. <laughs> Who's a gardener? <laughs> All right, so here we are back at our garden plan, and I'm going to color in those uh, Liatris ligula styl styluses. Styly? No. Liatris, the metal blazing stars. I'm going to color those in for you. Uh, more purple, of course. Now, I do have written here that Liatris ligula stylus can get from three to six feet tall. I have a couple in my yard that only ever get a foot tall because <laughs> the top of the soil is very loamy, but underneath that is clay. And so I think it's only half happy. <laughs> it doesn't like the clay, but it is fine with the loam. And so I, I do have a couple that are only a foot tall <laughs> and they only get about three or four of those flowers on them every year. So they're very unhappy. Uh, but they do still exist and make flowers. So if they're happy, they'll be three to six feet tall. If they're very unhappy, <laughs> they can be just a foot tall. Okay, and so now we're going to move on to plant number five. And so this is Liatris aspera, or the rough blazing star. So it looks very similar because they're all blazing stars. They're all in the Liatris genus. Um, and it looks very Dr. Seussian for the same reasons that the last Liatris was, right? It's got the sort of puffy flower heads. Um, it's sort of odd looking. I mean, that flower head, that is, that's Dr. Seuss written all over it. Um, and so this particular one, though, and I think it's because maybe it attracts the amazing monarch butterfly a little bit less. Uh, it's critically imperiled, imperiled, and vulnerable in some states. And it's overall not considered secure, but a, considered apparently secure, which means like it's perhaps at the beginnings of being in a little bit of trouble. Kind of depends which way we go. So I have a couple of these in the garden as well because they are a little bit different than the metal blazing star. Um, they're usually a little bit shorter than the metal blazing star. Um, but they bring in tons of pollinators too. This little bee is hiding from the rain underneath one of these flower heads. Um, and unlike the metal blazing star, the rough blazing star, this one uh, has, of all the liatris species, it has the most attractive seeds to birds. I mean, I guess the metal, okay, this one and the metal blazing star both have seeds that are attractive to birds. Um, but I have seen more birds on my Liatris aspera uh, than anything else. Um, 
I've seen three or four birds on a stalk when they go to seed all at the same time, just pecking away. So uh, it's a nice <clears throat> bird show after the flowers are done and they go to seed. And so this video here is just a little bit blurry. Um, I couldn't really get, I couldn't get any closer because the birds would fly away. <laughs> and my video when I zoom in just got more and more blurry because my camera is only so good. <laughs> but anyways, you can see three birds on there right now. Or is it four? Well, whatever. Uh, chomping away on those seeds on this Liatris aspera. So that's, that's pretty sweet. All right, here we are coloring that in, number five. More purple. Okay, so now we're at plant number six. This is Penstemon hirsutus, or hairy beard tongue. Now, that name itself, hairy beard tongue, you know Dr. Seuss would like that. <laughs> hairy beard tongue for the name of a flower. <laughs> oh gosh, okay. Um, so the reason that I chose this flower uh, is because it is tubular. And when you look very closely at the flower head, um, so they call it hairy beard tongue. At the end of that tubular flower, uh, the lower petals are sort of fused together and they look a little bit like a tongue hanging out. And then on top of it, there's these little filaments uh, that make it look like a bearded tongue, right? And then the hairy part has to do with the stem is a little bit hairy. So hairy beard tongue. And when I watch bumblebees try to get in and out of this narrow tubular flower, it's funny. <laughs> Their little bodies just don't quite fit. But they do. Like, that's the whole setup here between the bumblebees and the Penstemon hirsutus. It's a perfect setup, uh, but it is amusing to watch. And the way it tickles me is a way I think that it would uh, probably tickle Dr. Seuss and Dr. Seuss lovers as well. So uh, for Penstemon hirsutus, I have a video if you want to see what it looks like from a seed to a mature plant uh, in every season of the year. So you can see what it looks like in every season. Um, in partial shade versus sun versus shade shade, um, you will get blooming and it will be okay. In the sun, you get the most blooms, uh, the most stalks coming up to bloom. It's the most spectacular show. But in partial sun or in shade, they will still put up stalks. Um, they will still have some flowers on them, and they do still bloom. There's a little bee getting in there. <laughs> Look at them. <laughs> Sorry. Ooh. Um, anyways, this is a partial sunspot, and so there's really only this one stalk coming up that that bee was in. And in full sun spots like here, uh, each plant has a lot of stalks that come up in flowers. So it'll do fine um, in sun or partial shade or shade, but you just get more flowers and a more spectacular show in uh, full sun. And so here I am uh, coloring in here our plant number six, our Penstemon hirsutus. Um, <clears throat> I'm using a couple different colors because overall I don't know sort of a purplish color but there's some whitish in there maybe some pink and those little <clears throat> excuse me those little hairy filaments on that lower part of that tubular flower they're kind of yellowish and so you get there's a few different colors going on here maybe I should have written it's multicolored as well so we shall move forward now to plant number seven so this is another Monarda this is Monarda punctata is how I say it, um, which is spotted bee balm. Now, when I thought of Monardas for a Dr. Seuss native flower garden, this is the bee balm, the Monarda, that came to mind first. And I'm going to show you why. <laughs> so it is the host plant of the gray marvel moth. Um, overall, it's not endangered. It is considered secure. Okay, look at this flower. <laughs> okay, so first, multi-tiered, right? Um, so you can see by focusing on the yellowish part of the flower, you can kind of see the different tiers. And right, some of these I'm looking at right here on this screen have maybe two tiers or three to the flower, but I have seen them counted up to five tiers. So this can really get that tiered effect that Dr. Seuss liked on flowers. Multicolored, obviously, we've got pink, we've got white, we've got green, and then there's that yellow in there. And I don't know if I zoom in for you, hopefully I do in a moment. On that yellow, this is where you get spotted bee balm. 
the yellow part of that flower actually has little spots on it. So that's super cool, right? It's multicolored, but there's also a pattern on some of the flowers. <laughs> Amazing. Uh, the flowers themselves are actually tubular. So that'll be that little yellowish guy in there. So the pink that you're seeing here, it's like, oh, look at all those pink flower petals. Those are actually leaves, uh, a, a type of leaf. Um, and then it's that yellow in there. Oh, there, you can see the spotted on that yellow. Look at that. It's cool. Those are the actual legit flowers. The pink is, um, what would you call it? Uh, I can't think of the word. A deviation on a leaf. A modified leaf. There it is, modified. And so this little bumblebee is hiding from the rain underneath this Minarda punctata flower head or flowers and leaves. So that's cool. And then the seed heads for this spotted bee balm are puffy. And it's like tears of puffiness. So all those little yellowish flower rings that you see around, those will become these puffy seed heads. And so you get tears of puffy seed heads. So <clears throat> this to me is so Dr. Seussian. I mean, he really could have had this in one of his books, just as it is. No no alterations required. Um, and so there is an endangered butterfly called the Carner Blue Butterfly, and this is a one of the favorite nectar sources of the Carner Blue Butterfly. And if you're not in the region of the country where that butterfly is specifically, you, of course, can still plant this. You've seen an awful lot of bumblebees and little the little things you see flying around on your screen and you're like, it's there, it's gone. They look like little flies. Those are actually probably bees. Most bees are about as big as a grain of rice, even smaller. So um, those are probably actually all bees that you're seeing flitting about. Um, but if you don't live exactly where the Carner Blue Butterfly is, it is endangered. And with a changing climate that can be unexpected at times, sometimes you will see species pop up in places you might not expect. And so if you're anywhere near, and I believe Circa, Michigan is around. Now I'm going to have to look that up and fact check myself on where that endangered Carner Blue Butterfly is. But if you're anywhere in that neighborhood or even in the Midwest at all, to me, planting things that that butterfly likes is a, is a good move because A, they're native anyways, and B, if that Carner Blue butterfly, the endangered, the ones that are left, if they shift where they are at all in response to a changing climate and changing weather patterns, maybe they show up in your backyard and now you've got a plant to feed them, right? Okay, and here we are coloring in for our Minarda punctata, number seven. And now this one, uh, this spotted bee balm really does like soil that is on the sandier side. So loam is fine. Loam to sand is good. But if you are sitting on a pile of clay, uh, Minarda punctata will not do well for you on clay. It really doesn't like that. Not that I know from experience. <laughs> okay, plant number eight. This is Echinacea pallida, the pale purple coneflower. And so you can see I'm making a little drift of it here. Um, the pale purple coneflower is not the same as purple coneflower. So a lot of people, um, and I've said this before, when you get into native flower gardening, the purple coneflower is a very common first choice because it's very tame, it's very pretty. Uh, but I rather like the pale purple coneflower, which you're seeing here now. Uh, the petals are a little thinner and they droop down in a very cool way. And then when you look really closely at the petals, they are a pale purple, which is why it's called pale purple coneflower. <laughs> um, <clears throat> but sometimes when I look at them, and maybe not in this exact one here, but they almost look a little spotted sometimes. Sometimes I see like dark purple and light purple uh, occasionally, which I think looks very pretty too. Okay, now for all of these images, I'm not seeing any of the spottedness, so don't quote me on that. Um, but anyways, they have these really thin pale purple petals that are nice. Oh, here we are. Now you can see some spots. Anyways, um, it is critically imperiled, imperiled, and vulnerable in some states. And it's another one that is overall not considered secure, but apparently secure. So kind of a step down from secure. Um, so it's not a bad choice then, right? <clears throat> So why for Dr. Seuss would I have chosen this one? Well, the petals are thin, 
And especially in, uh, I had trouble in getting to Sala Salu, some of those early flowers, uh, the petals are very thin in that book. And then also it's that simple flower shape, kind of your standard common daisy head mazy type flower shape, right? It's draw a flower, you draw something that looks like this. So I'm getting at that quality to his stuff or to his illustrations, sorry. All right, going to color in those pale purple cone flowers now. And so there's kind of two clumps that kind of drift across your garden. Oh, I love the pale purple cone flower. <laughs> so I'm just thinking about it now, and it's like, oh, yeah, that's a good flower. That's a good one. All right, we've moved on to number nine. And number nine is Aquilasia canadensis, or the red columbine. Uh, so here I am, as always, putting it in on our garden, different little clumps of it here and there. Um, so the red columbine I chose for this garden because the flower is tubular, um, and it's sort of odd looking, right? Uh, but the first thing that made me think of it is that I know it's multicolored. So it's got that red, and then there's that yellow underneath. And so it's it's very notable and pretty, and it's two different colors that are there. Uh, hummingbirds do like this. So any flower that's red, you can guess that probably hummingbirds like them. They get drawn into red flowers. So red columbine is no different. Um, it is critically imperiled or imperiled in some locations and states, but overall this one is doing okay. I think when people, it's another one, when people get into native flower gardening and they're looking for a uh, early spring flower to plant, uh, this is one that they'll often pick, right? Which is nice. And as you can see, it's host plant to a few different butterflies, which again means the caterpillars for those butterflies will eat the leaves. Um, <clears throat> to get the nutrients they need to become a grown-up butterfly. So this is a pretty one to color in. <laughs> the red and the yellow is very nice. Okay, so number 10 here is Gallardia pulchella, uh, which is also called Indian blanket. Uh, so you can see me popping it in here in a few different places. Um, it's the host plant, as, as everything is to something, right? To a few butterflies and moths, which is good. Overall, it is considered secure. It's such a beautiful flower. It's got the multicolored. It's a simple flower, uh, that kind of that sim simple common flower shape that Dr. Seuss likes to. And then the seed head is puffy. So a lot of puffy seed heads, like I had said. And so Gallardia pulchella, <laughs> when I read that name, I first thought of um, the Spanish language, Mexico, Hispanic. That's what that name looks like to me. But it turns out that I'm wrong. <laughs> the first part of that name, the Gallardia, is named after a French guy who was uh, an amateur botanist. So that's that has nothing to do with Spanish. That's French. And then the pulchella means beautiful in Latin. So we have French and Latin coming together for this name. Um, but anyways, uh, the Indian blanket, this does fit Dr. Seuss for the multicolors, the simple flower shape, the puffy seed head. It's really pretty great. I mean, how cool are those colors? <laughs> of note for this particular flower, if you are thinking, oh good, I will take this and put this in my garden, let me buy some, be very, very careful to search for it by its scientific name, so Gallardia pulchella. And be sure the company you're getting it from is really giving you this native plant in its wild type form. This particular plant, because it's so amazing, right, of course, uh, people have been uh, hybridizing it and breeding it to make it more amazing because that's what we like to do. <laughs> and so um, there's a lot of hybrids out there of this particular plant. Um, I tend to shy away from it because I get so nervous. I really want native plants and not hybrids. But if you are strong and confident, and you are, um, use the scientific name and be sure you trust the company to give you not a hybrid but the real deal, um, and then you'll be good to go. Okay, another fun one to color in. And again, um, for this one, you can see I've got a couple different little clumps, the clumping and drifting, right? 
And for this whole garden, as I had said before, over time where these plants are will shift a little bit because they'll go to seed, they'll drop their seeds, and the seeds will and will not grow in different places in this little garden you have. And they'll shift a little bit, and you will let them shift. And then uh, they'll find their ways to where they most want to be with the neighboring plants that work best for them as well, right? For plant number 11, I have Sporobolus heterolepis, or prairie drop seed. Now you will notice on this Dr. Seuss garden plan, I don't even have a number 11 written. So what are you supposed to do? Well, sometimes when you're working on a garden, you have some extra space. Or a lot of times in between individual plants, you will want to have something to make weeds not grow. And native grasses are actually boring but important uh, for pollinators and creating a little community. And so I have this prairie drop seed here, and you can see it. It's a very um, compact, happy little guy. It doesn't spread beyond comprehension. Um, it's, it's, it is a somewhat favored grass in native plant gardens because it is sort of clump forming and tame, which is always nice. And it's not too tall, so it won't get in the way of your other flowers and stuff that you would like to see. Um, but it, to me, it can be a filler. Some people like to put these, um, I'll give you a link if I can, um, in a grid around their garden. And then they put the flowers around this grid of prairie drop seed or other native grasses. Um, again, you know, the native grasses, they're host plants too. So some moths and butterflies, their caterpillars will only eat the leaves of these things, right? Um, they also have flowers and they make seeds that birds eat. They do all the same things as the more impressive flowers that we like to look at. Um, but they do it for different species and they really um, fill out a native community uh, of plants and animals and insects and pollinators. So, and Dr. Seuss, just to be clear, uh, has a lot of grass and grasses and clumpy grasses in a lot of his illustrations too. So it is fitting and in keeping um, with all of that. Now I will say um, it is the host plant, as I said, of some butterflies and moths, and some of those are themselves endangered. So prairie drop seed is the host plant for some endangered butterflies and moths. And prairie drop seed itself is endangered in one, two, three, four, five, five states, which I have up on the screen there, you can see. So if you live in one of those states especially, my gosh, you can plant an endangered grass in your state and be pushing the tide back in the other direction, right? It's cool to have such power in your hands. <laughs> like, oh, I can plant something that's endangered and help it out. Very cool. Okay, so there we go. So here is our Dr. Seuss native flower garden plan. We've got the lurkum in the middle with your bench or stump uh, that says unless. And again, you can get a lawnmower around this garden. Um, you can get the lawnmower, the width of that lurkum will be the width of your lawnmower. And we got clumps and drifts of different flowers and plants. Uh, that are in keeping with the illustrations of Dr. Seuss. Okay, so the last bit I would say is if you're wondering, well, how do I care for this garden once I have it in? So when you're trying to get a native flower garden established, so maybe you've bought seeds or uh, little seedlings, little tiny plants, um, the first year or two can be more labor intensive because you have to water them a lot usually um, and pay attention and pull out things that don't belong there uh, as the plants are filling in and finding their roots and getting their spot. Do you know what I mean? And so the first year or two can be more labor intensive and in that first year or two you're often like, well hell, I thought native plants belong here so they should be easier to take care of. <laughs> They are. You just have to get them established first. And so once your Dr. Seuss native flower garden is established after a year or two, then the care of it should ease up significantly because whatever your weather conditions are here in the United States, um, this these flowers and plants are set for it. They know what to do.
Um, if you notice um, insects on there and if you look up those insects and you go, uh-oh, that's an insect that'll chomp up my plant, uh, generally I urge not to spray. <laughs> um, so also when plant predators come along, little insects and stuff that will eat up your leaves um, <clears throat> or the petals, um, it's disheartening at first, but if you wait for a year or two, do you know what comes in? The predators for those insects, because that's the way nature works. <laughs> Wherever there's something to be eaten, something to eat it will come along. <clears throat> so I have a video looking at um, from seed all the way to established plant, looking at swamp milkweed. I'll give you a link in the video description, but in that video, over time you can start to see oh, there's different insects here that are going to eat up my plant. And then, oh, here comes the predators of those insects who are going to eat them. <laughs> and this is how you get a whole ecosystem going, right? So don't spray right away to get rid of stuff or to make everything look perfect. Let it be. Let different predators come in. It will balance out. And you, this is how you create a little habitat in your yard, right? Uh, is to let it be and to let the predators come to eat the things that are eating your plant, right? And also, a couple other notes, plants have ways of handling getting chomped on by insects because they've been here a long time with these very insects. They know what to expect. They know that the aphids are going to come and they change in their leaves, in their flowers, in their nectar, in their seeds, in their pollen. They change um, like what the constituents are and how the flower and leaf, like the functioning of it, they change it when they're getting nibbled on or chomped on. Um, it changes what it does. These plants are not idiots and they're not dullards. They are expecting to get eaten and they're ready for it, right? And they respond and they respond right away. So that's great. Also, um, Holes in your leaves and stuff can also be good because you don't get the beautiful butterflies floating around your garden if you don't get their caterpillars first. And those caterpillars need to eat and they'll eat those leaves and you will let them. <laughs> that way you can get to see the big floaty butterflies that we love, right? And the last note I will uh, say is in the fall time, a lot of people feel the need to do something with all of these stalks that are up in the garden. All the flowers are gone. Maybe some of the seeds are gone. The leaves are just kind of dried and shriveled up. And for us, we've always been taught that like, oh, you have to chop all this down and get rid of it. It's garbage. Again, in the creation of a little mini habitat in your yard, um, <clears throat> it's surprising how much all of what just looks like standing dead junk to us is important to the very pollinators that we're trying to get a show from in the spring and the summer, right? And so um, what looks like dead stalks, a lot of bees will use those to make um, nests in in the early springtime, right? And so if you get rid of all of the standing dead stalks of these plants, you're getting rid of bee nesting sites. You don't need a bee hotel from the internet. The stalks in your yard are actually the way that it is naturally, right? Um, and then all those dead leaves and stuff that kind of fall and look sort of junky on the ground there, it's a natural fertilizer. And also a lot of insects use those for cover and protection from the winter weather and from predators. And then all the little seed heads, birds use those. And some of those seed heads get used all winter long. Birds will come and eat the seeds from them. And so, um, there's a lot of use here from birds and insects and animals on what just looks like dead stuff to us, right? And the last thing, I just read this and it's so interesting. Some butterflies <laughs> use um, leaves that are becoming dried and shriveled and they like rub against them until the leaf releases, uh, darn it, I forget the name of the chemical. P PA is the abbreviation people use. They release this PA, which is a, a toxic chemical specifically monarch butterflies will scrape this off and then they use it the monarch butterfly itself will use that chemical to defend itself and so what looks to us like dry leaves that are becoming dead and shriveled and useless even monarch butterflies themselves and other insects are using them to get some of the chemicals out to use them for their own purposes and so there's all this stuff going on and even if you don't know about all of it or understand it or even care 
<laughs> all this stuff is going on and it's important to leave things there so that all these processes can happen. And I just have to add a final note. I do because I'm a blabbermouth. If you really can't stand the look of it, um, some people will chop, like you leave about a foot, a foot and a half of these different stalks in the garden and you can chop off above there. And then you take all the stuff you chopped off and you stand them up like in the back of your yard somewhere or behind your garage where no one can see. And so your native flower garden looks more tidy to people's eyes. It looks like you have done something a care queue it's called a queue that you're taking care of your yard um, <clears throat> and the foot long or foot tall stalks that you've left insects and bees can still use them to make nests and then all the bundled up stalks that you chopped off the top wherever you stack those up those leaves and stalks can still get used by other insects too so they can still serve their purpose and your native flower garden can look like you're caring for it in a way that our human eyes understand, right? Okay, so that is caring for your Dr. Seuss garden. <laughs> so congratulations. Today is your day. You have brains in your head. You have feet in your shoes. You can steer yourself any direction you choose. And the direction you've chosen today is this native flower garden plan because you like Dr. Seuss, and so do I. <laughs> and you can mow around it, and you can sit in a lorcum now and think and wonder and wonder and think, if I plant native, things will change a whole awful lot. <laughs> <laughs>